Hi, everyone. It is great to see some of your faces and also your names. So thank you so much for joining us. We're going to get started in just about one minute. We're going to see if any other students um, are trickling in. Uh, you can see on the screen that if you can put your PIT username, so that's the alpha numeric, so mine's ESW27, it really helps us in order to make sure that we send you resources um, after this event. Um, lots of really, really good things are going to be coming your way, but we want to make sure that you get them. Um, so definitely put your information in the chat. Um, so we are going to get started probably at about less than a minute. Everybody get ready for some social. Right, we're going to get started. So welcome everyone. My name is Erin Wheeler. I am a career consultant um, at the Career Center here at the University of Pittsburgh. And I just want to talk about what we're going to be doing tonight. So the structure of the event is um, I'm going to do a presentation just about the social aspect of adulting, um, how to make friends, um, the things to keep in mind when you're going out there in the world, maybe you're already out there and you want some additional tips. Um, and then following that, we're going to have our young alumni council. Um, some members are here and there's going to be a panel where you can ask them your questions, get some more information from people that are recently that recently graduated. And um, it's going to be a great a great hour. So I'm going to first kick it over to Nazreen. And she's going to just talk a little bit about the alumni panel um, itself. So, Nazreen. Thanks, Erin. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nazreen Haroon. I graduated from Pitt in 2016. And this year, I'm one of the recruitment chairs for the Young Alumni Council. Um, so we are entering our recruitment season and looking for the next uh, crop of, of Pitt alum who want to join uh, this organization. So what we are is that uh, we're a group of around 20 to 25 alum from the past 10 years. And we serve as kind of like the leadership group for the overall young alumni network, which is every Pitt graduate from the past 10 years. Um, so like I said, we have applications open for our next um, term, which is a two year term to be on the council. Um, what we do is kind of just be involved in, in a lot of different initiatives to make sure that we're keeping alumni from the university in the past 10 years engaged with Pitt. And that can be in a lot of different ways. Um, one of which is participating in events such as this tonight, um, either with, with students or, or graduating students or, um, or alumni, obviously young alum is where our focus is. So we have events during homecoming, um, this past December, we had a trivia night for alumni all across the country. So we'll do some programming like that. We also serve as liaisons to different parts of the university, such as athletics and giving. So we can make sure that the young alumni voice is involved in different university initiatives. And then overall, we're just trying to kind of be pit, pit spirit leaders and help make sure that when people graduate from Pitt, they know how to stay connected after graduation. So um, a lot of just communication strategies and, and different ways to make sure that people know how to stay involved with Pitt um, after they actually leave campus. So um, little, that's a little bit about what the group does. Our applications uh, were open this week and will be open until the Friday before Memorial Day. I'll post a link in the chat for the application. And then we also have a few info sessions coming up um, to actually learn more about the group and ask us any questions that you might have. Um, so I'll include all of that information as well as uh, contact information to reach me if you have any other questions. But just wanted to put that plug out there for if people are thinking of how they'll stay connected to Pitt after graduating. Thanks, Erin, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you so much, Nazreen. And I, I know firsthand, you know, talking to a lot of students and just the ability to network and how important that is um, 
if you're moving to a new city or you know if you're in your current city wherever that happens to be and having that home base of the University of Pittsburgh and having that connective um, fiber is so important. So definitely consider joining this group so that you know you never know how that's going to help you and support you throughout the first few years out of college. So thank you so much. Um, I do want to mention that um, I'm going to be going like out sharing the screen, not sharing the screen, going to different websites and videos and things like that. So please be patient with me as I sort of am I'm doing all of that and I'm going to do it real quick right now because I forgot to enable sound when I went to share. So give me just a second to do that. All right, here we go. All right, so um, today we are really focusing on the social aspect of adulting and really how that shifts quite a bit from your college life, even your high school life. And now all of a sudden you're in this new world where I guess I'm an adult not really sure, like all of a sudden I graduated and now that's my title. Um, so we're gonna talk a lot about what that looks like, how we can really work with it, um, different tips and tricks from, from me and from the alum that are gonna be on the panel later on during our event. So again, my name is Erin Wheeler. I am a career consultant at the Career Center. I specialize in liberal arts, pre-business, social work and education. Um, I have been out of undergrad for 10 plus years. I won't go into any more numbers than that. <laughs> if you really want to find out, you can look on my LinkedIn, um, which you're welcome to link up with me as well. Um, but my career journey is really different. I started out as an elementary education teacher. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, that makes sense. I could hear the teacher voice. Yes, that was me. Um, so I started off as a teacher taught for years and then decided I am done. I need something different. And I switched over to college, got my master's and here I am today. Um, so what we're gonna talk about, here's a little agenda, is we're gonna talk about how to, learning how to make friends outside of college. We're also gonna talk about eating healthy on a budget, uh, keeping a healthy work-life balance, which is super fun exercising, which is a necessary thing, um, practicing self-care, which is so vital and very important to just make sure that you're taking care of yourself and getting involved. How can we really get involved? And um, like Nazarene was saying, one of those ways is definitely to join the um, Young Alum Council. And I'm, I'm sort of interested in that trivia night. So maybe you'll see me there. Um, all right. So how to make friends as an adult. And um, this can be really a new thought that you might be thinking, I'm, I'm gonna be fine. I'm gonna make tons of friends. I've had friends all my life. And that's wonderful. And I want you all to have that positive attitude as you're going into the world. But it shifts a little bit because your life shifts. Now, all of a sudden, you're not necessarily with your best friends all the time. Maybe you're not even living with anybody. Maybe you're living by yourself or you're living with someone that you found online that is living in the same place and needed a, a roommate. You know, there's lots of different circumstances and the circumstances really do shift as you get that first job and you move on to adulting. So one of the first things to really do as you're looking through, okay, how do I do this? is really reconnecting with old friends. So people that maybe you lost ties with from high school, but then you find out through um, social media that maybe they're in the same area and the same city that you are now living in. Shoot them a, a text, find them on social media, um, connect with them again. The worst thing that's gonna happen is you're like, mm, yeah, I, I realize I'm like not really vibing anymore with you and that's okay. I, um, I'm also going to talk a lot about my own personal life and like my story and, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But um, I was best friends with this um, girl named Liz when I was in high school. And then when I moved back to Pittsburgh, she was in Pittsburgh. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I'm so excited. And we started chatting again. And I was like, I think that we might have drifted apart. <laughs> and that's okay. You know, that doesn't, you don't have to remain best friends with someone forever, but at least try definitely reconnect with those individuals. The next thing that I really want you to be thinking about is to have your own hobby. And this is really about being interesting. 
You know, so if you're really invested in something that you love, most likely a couple things are going to happen. Number one, you're going to be happy and happy people gravitate towards happy people. So that's going to really be joyful. The second thing is you're going to find people that like similar things. And the third is that you're going to be interesting. You're going to have things that you can talk about. So if you really like music, you have that to be able to have a conversation with someone about. If you're really into art or you're really into exercising and all these different things can really be helpful as you're trying to find that um, set of friends. Be vulnerable. And this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, Brene Brown, which hopefully you've heard of her. Um, she's an amazing author, uh, speaker. She's done a lot of TED Talks just about vulnerability. Um, and so being vulnerable is really important as you're going out there um, and making new friends. And so I love this quote, and I'm going to take the time to even read it out loud. When we find the courage to share our experiences and the compassion to hear others tell their stories, we force shame out of hiding and end the silence. And this type of thought process is so important as you're starting to make friends, right? And think about that. Think about when we're really vulnerable and maybe we're going through something that's a little bit challenging and we talk to a friend. Don't you feel closer to that person because you've shared that and then maybe they share as well a similar situation. And so you have brought yourself closer together with that individual. So it's really important to be vulnerable. Make the time. And here's, a, here's another quote that I absolutely love. Save the excuses. It's not about having time, it's about making time. If it matters, you will make the time. And it's actually a little bit of, it could be a pet peeve when somebody's like, oh no, I don't have time. Well, you're not making the time, right? You need to make a time and make a schedule for yourself. And it doesn't have to be a strict schedule, but if you feel really um, empowered to meet new people, you need to make the time and put in the effort to meet new people. It's not just gonna happen. And so making the time, um, carving that out in your schedule, making the time to um, you know, work on those budding relationships. Um, when I first graduated, I moved away from home. I knew nobody when I, actually that's not true. I knew one person when I moved to Virginia is where I moved from or moved to. And I met someone when I was teaching in new teacher orientation, her name's Tara. And I remember I was like, okay, I need to be vulnerable. I need to go out of my way. I need to, she seems nice. So I went up to her and I was like, I like your shoes. You know, easy, easy thing to compliment somebody on something that they're wearing. And we started talking. She's my best friend now. Years and years later, that vulnerability that I showed and the time that we were able to make for each other and to grow our friendship has really come full circle. So pretty amazing. So this sort of goes along with the idea of your hobbies, right? So thinking about joining or starting a group. And I say this all with a little bit of a caveat that obviously we're in a pandemic right now. So things might be a little bit different at this exact moment, but hopefully that's going to shift um, very, very soon. Um, but even things like virtual book clubs, you know, that's something that you can definitely be doing um, talking to people about what you're reading. I know um, our office, we have a little virtual book club and we are always talking about books and it's just nice to not talk about work, to talk about something else. Um, but if you're really into sports, joining different sports leagues or if you're into hiking or really anything, I know that Meetup has a, like anything that you can possibly think of is on there. Um, I have a friend who's really interested in cryptocurrency. So if cryptocurrency is something you're interested in, there's a group for that, um, you know, so all these things can be really helpful as you're trying to um, build out your friendship group. And this is another one of my favorite quotes, and I think about this quite often. We have three types of friends in our life, friends for a reason, friends for a season, and friends for a lifetime. And that really rings true. And I think about, you know, my, my life trajectory, and, you know, there were people in my life that were my friends and they were there for a very specific time period. They were there for a season. Maybe I worked with them, um, you know, something like that. It was a longer period of time. Friends for a reason, something had happened either to them or to me and they were really an amazing support system 
um, in good times or bad times. And then you have those wonderful individuals that are your friends for a lifetime that are really the ones that are there through the thick and thin. Um, and those are pretty amazing people. I read a statistic one time that said that if you are friends with someone for seven years, that means they're your lifetime friend. Like you will always be friends with them. And I love that little, little statistic. So really fun to think about. Okay, so here's the video part. So fingers crossed that it works. <laughs> um, so if I could just get some head nods when the um, voice comes on, he's going to be singing. Um, it's only about a two minute video. Um, and also, I want to again say this is pre pandemic. So hopefully this will be um, situational post pandemic as well. So here we go. <laughs> Little head Why nod. can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? Thank you. <laughs> Do you realize that after you graduate college, that is the last time you're in a large social gathering with so much opportunity to mingle and make friends? Take this circle. This represents all the possibilities you have when making friends at school. Once you graduate, that circle looks like this, a lot smaller, because the only social gathering you're probably going to have is work. That's right. Work or the office is the only place you can expect social interaction on a day-to-day -day basis. Your routine is going to be wake up, breakfast, drive to work, work, drive home, watch TV, eat, sleep, and repeat. So how are you going to make friends? Well, if our issue is limited possibilities of social gatherings, then we have to increase the number of social gatherings. If you're in the work routine cycle that I stated before, then time may not allow you to increase, Oops, sorry about that. increase your social gatherings during the weekday. Now, to combat this, we have to look at the weekend. We have to get active and fully explore our interests. If you like basketball like myself, then join a league or work a game or two in your schedule during the week. I've done this and continue to do this and found it extremely helpful to expand your social circle. Now I have a group of people I hoop with on the weekend. Another idea is happy hour with coworkers. Now, if you're working day to day, then it can feel lonely in a cubicle. And the only interaction you have are those you work with on a project. And those interactions can be interesting. One day, mix it up and suggest happy hour. Happy hour is awesome because it builds existing relationships and allows for you and your coworker to just let your hair down and relax and enjoy each other's company. Lastly, if all else fails, connect with people on social media, not a dating website, rebuild relationships from years ago, or join a group. Nothing wrong with cyber friends, as you all are my cyber friends. Thanks for watching, and remember, know the answers before the test. See you next time. I'm out. Okay. So here's where I was saying that I would have to go back and forth. <laughs> so hopefully those resonated with you. Um, like I said, this is... Um, that was pre-pandemic, but I can tell you, because I lived in pre-pandemic times, that um, yes, your work is going to be the majority of your time. So it is important to make sure that you're carving out, remember making time to meet other people. But with that being said, the people that you meet at work, they really might become some of your best friends. I mean, I have amazing friendships that I was able to form at work and it's interesting we just had a survey come out for um, Pitt staff. And one of the questions was, is your best friend at work? And I was like, they are. <laughs> and so, you know, there are gonna be some um, people that you're really gonna connect with at work. Um, and so that's gonna, make, that's gonna make life easier. And then you're gonna see another whole circle of friends because of their group as well. Um, okay, so now we're gonna move in, I know, uh, we want to be very cognizant of time, but we're going to move into the self-care and wellness section. Um, and so what's really important is, a, is taking care of your body, um, making sure that you're eating the right things, that you are exercising, um, which can be very, very challenging. Um, 
the exercising part might come a little bit easier because as a new employee, there might be some benefits. There might be a gym that you're able to join or a discount at particular gyms, anything like that. Um, I personally would really take advantage if there, if you really like a certain activity, for me, it's yoga, um, to get the monthly pass because in the long run, that's probably gonna be cheaper as long as you're really active in that. And plus it's sort of like, forces you to do it because you're already paying for it monthly. Um, so think about that. Also think about the different activities that um, your work might provide. So I know that for Pitt, they actually have exercise classes that you can do um, for really discounted price because you know that self-care, wellness is very important. And a lot of companies nowadays are really, really pushing that because a healthy employee actually costs them a lot less money. So they want healthy people to be working for them. So make sure that you're looking at those benefits as well when you're um, looking at those first time jobs. Um, okay, so I am going to show you a website, maybe. Give me just a second. All right. I'm gonna put this in the chat um in after i'm finished so it'll come after my presentation but this is an amazing website that um i stumbled upon so it's usda my plate through the department of um, agriculture and one of the biggest things that i have noticed that is a really big um struggle maybe it was just me but i didn't have a ton of money and you know eating healthy is expensive it's a lot easier to eat unhealthy because it's cheaper. Um, so this is a really great website because what it does is right down at the bottom, it has a total cost icon. So I already have click the cheapest version and then it gives you all kinds of recipes for that. And then this is the other thing that I absolutely love is you can look and see, okay, I know I need to eat more fruits and vegetables, but I don't wanna pay a lot of money. So what's gonna give me the most bang for my buck? Well, here's 78 different recipes that can be really helpful to eat healthy, but also making um, sure that your budget isn't being broken. And you can see the other variables as well that you can be clicking. Um, you can do it by nutritional focus, that you need more calcium, reduced sodium, whatever it happens to be, different food groups, um, the cooking equipment, so maybe you don't have a microwave, so you need to use an oven, or maybe you don't have a, um, maybe you don't have an oven and you need to use a microwave, whatever it happens to be. So this can be really helpful. Notice also it has this no cooking required, which can be really great as well. So these are just absolutely amazing tools um, to be able to sort of get some new recipes. And of course, there's gonna be tons and tons of different websites that you can go to. But in my experience, um, not a lot have this cost icon. So um, that's why I really love this one particularly. All right, we're gonna go back to the presentation. Okay. Okay, so another good way to really practice self-care is to definitely surround yourself with good people. Um, you know, stay the, I like this quote, stay close to people that make you feel like sunshine, right? So happy people encourage happy people to be around them. So, you know, if you're feeling a little bit meh, reach out to the people that make you feel happier. You know, it's as simple as that. And sometimes it feels like, why do you need to even say that, Erin? But sometimes you do. Sometimes you just need a reminder. Sound around yourself with happy people. The other thing that I want to talk about is giving of yourself. So whenever you give back, um, it's actually physiologically, you feel better about yourself. Your mood will automatically boost because you're giving back. So it's this really great, um, great thing. So even if you're um, walking down the street, you give a dollar to a homeless person, or maybe you run into CVS and grab them, you know, some beef jerky and water or whatever it happens to be giving back really helps boost your own mood as well, which is part of that self-care. 
But here's some ideas as well of how you can be giving back. You know, if you're really into animals, helping with an animal shelter, or maybe a local library, whatever it happens to be, um, again, after the pandemic, when everybody is safe. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can give back that's going to make you feel really good, um, but also giving back to the community that you're in. Okay, so um, really important to also acknowledge that you need to de-stress and how you can de-stress. Um, and so what I want everyone to do, just sort of an interactive part, is I want you to think about how do you decompress? What are some ways that you do that? And I'm looking at the chat right now to see, see him fall in. Read, definitely binge on Netflix, absolutely. Take your dog for a walk. <laughs> Watching Lord of the Rings. I have a friend who um, anytime she's just feeling a little bit a little bit down, she starts watching Harry Potter or reading Harry Potter. It automatically lifts up her mood. So Chris, I get that. <laughs> Listen to music, make music, cooking. I like that slowing down, focus on something. Absolutely. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much for everyone who, who shared. Um, yes, you know, finding your own ways and making that a priority for you and acknowledging that that's a way that you really need to decompress and you really need to, to take a second and work on that. Getting enough sleep. I was actually just listening to a podcast today that was talking about brain health and how it's so important, you know, to be cognizant of um, the things that really help your brain um, with memory. That, that's what they were specifically talking about. And he was saying, this was a doctor, you know, you must get sleep. And when you sleep, it's actually your body's way of getting rid of plaque in your brain and sort of like this cleaning system. And so if you're not getting enough sleep, you're not allowing your body to have that recharge and cleaning of itself. And so that plaque is sort of gonna build up just like on your teeth, right? Like if you don't brush your teeth, it's gonna build up. And so you really wanna make sure that you're getting enough sleep. Everybody is different. Everybody needs a little bit different amount of sleep. And so don't think, oh, well, this person over here only needs five hours and they're perfectly fine. Okay, well, that's not you. You might need more. So be really thinking about how much sleep works for me. And the way that you can really figure that out is on the weekend, if you go to sleep at a normal time, 11, 12, whatever, what time do you naturally wake up? Um, and that's about how much sleep you need. Um, that could just be your starting point. Okay, this is one of my favorite things as well, is the ability to get help when you need it. Talking to somebody, going to counseling, going to therapy, very important. Let's get rid of the thought that we can't talk about how we go to therapy. I go to therapy and it is incredibly helpful for me because I'm able to talk about my feelings with someone who doesn't really know the situation. They're a complete outsider and they can give a very, very constructive um, feedback to me. Um, so, I, and I'm not blabbering in my friend's ears all the time about X, Y, or Z. It's somebody who can really, really help me untangle things that are going on within my mind. And this is something else to really be considering as you're looking through different um, jobs and healthcare options is do, what do they offer in terms of counseling? Is it, is it covered at all? Is there a copay? Something like that. Um, and again, depending on your company, they might have some counselors or therapists that they have a contract with that maybe you can meet with them for six times for free or something like that. So really be thinking about that and setting something up. I know that sometimes it can be a little, um, a little hard to even start because it's like, oh gosh, I have to start at the beginning of my life and tell my whole life story about what's going on and why I'm upset right now. Um, but once you get over those first few sessions of doing that, it really is amazing. And I highly, highly, highly recommend it. I think everyone can use an outsider's opinion. Okay, um, the last thing that I'm really gonna talk about before I go into some resources and then we'll go start with our panel is Zoom fatigue. And there was actually an article, um, and this is part of self-care, right? We need to be cognizant of how much Zoom is going on in our lives. 
um, which is a lot. Um, and there was an article that Stanford um, published recently about um, ways to really combat some of these, um, uh, these issues. So the first one you can see is that we have this excessive amount of close-up eye contact. It's really intense. So the way to remedy that is to minimize face size um, and maybe even use a separate keyboard if that's possible so that you can move your um, actual monitor somewhere and then still be typing. So that's a way to not have it be so close and tight in front of your face. Um, the second is seeing yourself during video chat um, in real time is fatiguing. And I know for sure that that's me. <laughs> it is really hard to look at yourself talking. Um, and it's sometimes alarming. And so one way to sort of combat that, even if you aren't talking, is to hide your self view option or use gallery view so that you're not necessarily seeing yourself, you're seeing a lot of other people as well. Um, the third is that video chat dramatically reduces our usual mobility, which is very true, right? You know, we're used to walking to meetings or walking over here, walking across the hall, whatever it happens to be. So another remedy for that is again, using that ex external keyboard, turning your camera off, maybe not having earbuds in, but just being able to walk around or um, maybe even have a standing desk, a standing board, something like that, or maybe even have Bluetooth headphones and then you can be walking around um, while you're still involved in the meeting. You're just not right there staring at everybody else or yourself. Um, and then the cognitive load is much higher. Your brain is just working a ton more in these video chats. So it's really important to be able to take these visual breaks. Um, so trying to build that in, taking a walk, you know, we talked about those ways to de-stress. So taking a walk, maybe reading a little, just changing up the day to day so that it can, it's not as impactful on your eyes and your, and your brain. So I'm going to go through these um, fairly fast, but I would really encourage you to take some screenshots of these different apps that are helpful. Um, so these are for meditation mo and motivation. Um, amazing. I use Headspace a lot for some of their background noise. It can be really, really lovely when I'm just sort of trying to get into my Zen moments. These are some healthy habits. Um, this to don't list is really cool because it's it allows you to cross things off the list that you don't want to do. So for example, it'll you it'll prompt you, but you can choose whatever you want. Like today, I am not going to bite my nails. Um, today, I am not going to eat bread, whatever it happens to be. And then you cross it off at the end of the day. Um, and it should just be feel sort of like a nice little check mark. Um, and then this is some self-care for food and finance. So a couple really great opportunities. If you were in Lauren's presentation last night, she talked about Mint, um, which is a great app um, to help with that. And then I'm gonna talk about my favorite things. So these are things that make me feel good, you know, that are just nice. And um, if you know me at all, my weakness is Starbucks. I know it's expensive, I get it, but it brings me such joy. So I, Treat myself to Starbucks every once in a while. Um, I also really love podcasts. And some of my favorite are Armchair Expert. I love to go on walks, listen to my podcasts, and No F's Giving, which if you haven't started listening to it, it's brand new. She only has about maybe 12 episodes out. And it talks a lot about how to combat anxiety, um, how to make sure that you're um, not letting your emails get overwhelming, uh, time management. So it's absolutely amazing. Um, I already mentioned yoga is amazing for me, as well as um, cat videos. Who can't laugh after you see a cat video, right? Perfect way to, to um, de-stress. All right, so I'm going to finish with this adulting um, uh, definition, is mimicking things you see real adults do in an attempt to trick people into thinking you are a real adult as well. <laughs> and that's just what we're all doing. We're just all trying our best. Um, so um, these are some events that are coming up. Um, Gabby's going to put a lot of different links in the chat for a lot of these different events um, that are a lot of them are tomorrow. We do have our final adulting presentation that Gabby will be doing. So it's on professional wellness. So how do you, when you get that first job, how does it go? 
um, which could be absolutely amazing. And then the last thing is that we would love to hear if you have your job already secured, please, please, please go to this website and fill out the survey. It really helps us um, with understanding where students are. Um, and if you do fill it out, you will be in a drawing to win a pair of Apple AirPods. And so now I'm gonna pass it over to Kelly um, for the panel. Thank you all for listening. Awesome, thanks Erin, appreciate it. Uh, that was a great presentation and I'm writing down all those podcasts to start listening to this, so great. So great. Um, so thanks everyone for being with us tonight. My name is Kelly Wummer and I'm a representative from the Young Alumni Council. Uh, tonight our panelists will include Ashley Firm, Gordon Lauterbach, and Alex Murdoch. So I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves and tell a little bit about themselves. Uh, Gordon, if you want to go first. Sure. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Aaron. Great presentation. So yeah, I'm Gordon Lauterbach. I graduated in 2013 um, with my civil engineering degree from Pitt. I immediately moved out to Denver, um, where I've lived since. Um, so if anyone is, has any questions about moving into a new city, especially far away from home. I'm originally from Philadelphia. And yeah, I've been working um, with the same company since graduation. It's called Turner. Uh, it's a construction management firm. And um, yeah, I'm also part of the Young Alumni Council. So Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Gordon. I see in the chat that Sydney is moving to Denver this summer, so you have to connect. All right, <laughs> got to meet up. Awesome. All right, uh, Ashley, if you want to go next. Sure. Um, so my name's Ashley Firm. I graduated in 2014 from the School of Pharmacy. Um, I then moved to Georgia to complete a residency for a year. So I also moved, and I knew no one in the area, not like one single soul at all. Um, and then a year later, I moved back to Pittsburgh, and I now work as faculty in the um, School of Health and Rehabilitation Science and the Physician Assistant Studies Department. So again, kind of like a little bit of a, a shift outside of the normal of what pharmacists do. Awesome. And Alex? Awesome. Thanks for uh, everyone joining this evening. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Murdoch. I'm a 2013 CBA graduate, 2014 CATS graduate um, with uh, an accounting major. Um, so I, I graduated from Pitt and, and started working at Deloitte. Um, maybe you're familiar with there in, there in Pittsburgh for a couple of years. Uh, and then actually similar to the other two, um, trans or traveled down and worked in Tampa for, for the better part of two years uh, in Florida. And then um, coming up on now after that, two years of being in Chicago, Illinois. So um, if anyone's coming out to Chicago, definitely let me know and uh, looking forward to be of any help this evening that can be. Great. Thank you to our panelists for being here. Um, so now we'll open up the floor to, for you guys to ask any and all questions to our panelists. Um, and because we wanna meet as many of you virtually at least as possible, um, feel free to turn your camera on for this portion of the panel or when you're asking a question so we can meet you. Um, and also feel free to drop your questions in the chat if you would like to as well. Any brave souls want to go first? Sure, uh, why not? So I guess my question is for anyone who moved like far away from kind of your, I guess where you were based, like either where you grew up or if you went away for college, moving away from there, kind of how did you go about kind of dealing with essentially leaving behind any of like your social support network and trying to kind of rebuild from the ground up then? I mean, I think we could probably all speak to it in some regard. I'd say in two things to that. One, I didn't necessarily leave it behind. I mean, fun fact I learned tonight, Gordon and I have been friends for probably eight or 10 years now. So we're lifelong friends, I found out. I had no idea. Um, so I know, I think it's it's like striking a balance of, of using and, and staying connected to that. Because when the question came up of how do you de-stress, like one easy thing that I, I typically do is reach out to those like kind of lifelong friends that aren't here to, to just talk and one of them just called me while we were we were sitting here actually and obviously didn't answer but um so yeah no staying connected with with those friends and everything is I think definitely key and I mean 
it seemed like every slide that um, was being presented that Aaron presented on tonight, I had like jotted down like something that I've done here in Chicago or a different city of um, staying connected to the local pit club. I, in Tampa, I initially went to a couple events there and here in Chicago, I've become pretty actively involved in it. Um, intramural sports is something here in Chicago that I've, I've gotten involved with uh, over the past year or so. And it was just a, a reconnection of somebody I knew at Pitt that, again, like Aaron mentioned, had reached out over Facebook. And, and I don't know, it, it takes time, um, at least in my experience it did. It, it doesn't happen overnight, but um, I'll, I'll let the other two chime in to see if they have anything else to add on. Yeah, I think so. I, I moved um, right out to Denver as soon as I graduated. And I did have my brother out here, which definitely helped the transition. So I think kind of recommending if you have even like a long lost high school friend or acquaintance to reach out because I ended up reaching out to a high school friend that lived here in Denver. Didn't really become good friends with them, but through my initial couple months of hanging out with them, I met their friends which met, led me to more people. And then I found the people kind of like what Aaron mentioned, you find the people you connect with. And I ended up connecting better with some of their friends than the actual person for, that I knew from high school. And now I'm still friends with those other people now, but not as much as the person from high school. Um, so it's really like branching out to any network you have access to, whether it be an old friend, a family member, um, or somebody from the alumni network. And then you slowly meet people through them and it, it branches off and you find the people you connect with. And that's my recommendation there. And I think just to highlight um, part of what you're asking is kind of like leaving that social support you have built currently. Um, and I think one thing that both Alex and Gordon have highlighted is that you have to put yourself out there in your new location. So you can't just stay home or just only exist in your whatever known networks if you happen to know a person. Um, so you do have to find some ways to meet people outside maybe who you're just meeting at work and they highlight some great things. But I also think it's important, um, and Aaron did a great job about like kind of highlighting like friendships for different amounts of time to realize that you're probably not going to stay as close with every person you knew in high school and every person you knew in college and every person you currently know. And that's okay um, not to worry about and putting too much energy and stress into maintaining these relationships that just aren't flourishing on their own. So it's okay if you have friends that you're still really close to, but you don't have to talk to them every day. I have a best friend in Tampa that I talk to a handful of times, uh, you know, a month or, you know, even less than that. But like, I know that she's still my best friend. So you don't have to worry about spending hours on the phone or, or doing things like that with the people you have in your current location. So make sure you a lot that in your new location to find some people outside of um, just those small groups. All right. Thanks guys. So we got a question in the chat. Um, so really, I'm sure all of you can speak to this in one way. Um, do you have any advice on how to stay connected to professionals you've met? How often do you email them? Is it weird to mail them out of nowhere just to say, hi, I still exist? <laughs> Um, I think you can email them as often as you have something useful to email them about. So to email them to say, hi, I still exist. I know that wasn't, you know, exactly what you're going to do, but just say like a hi, I'm still here, probably not um, the most fruitful. There's other ways you can do that. So if you're connected with them on LinkedIn and you see that they've posted something, you can put a congratulations or something small on that because that's a little bit more of a, a short and sweet kind of um place to, to leave those types of notes. But if it's a, a more formal email, I would say as often as you have something meaningful to email them about. And I guess to add on to that, um, and maybe it'll be covered in tomorrow night's session. So highly recommend you, you attend that. Um, but, but looking in going to, to kind of networking events and that, that can be another way, I guess, to build out kind of your social network is to identify and find people of like-minded or interests in the same kind of career and field. And, and so maybe it's not a, a direct connection you already have, but, but once you go and make those initial connections, obviously following up on them, or um, I know the company that, that I currently work for, I mean, they, they definitely push, you know, reaching out to people who have either you worked with in the past that have left the firm and, and staying connected. And you can, there's certainly nothing wrong with writing. Hi, you still exist. Uh, what are you up to these days? Just checking in like to Aaron's point earlier, worst case, they just don't respond and, I mean, they're not prioritizing that time and relationship. And then there's nothing you can really do about that at this point, as long as you're putting yourself out there and, and trying to commit time to it is how I look at it. 
And the last bit of advice in terms of making professional connections is always, obviously within your company is a lot easier, right? You interact with those people regularly, but join like either trade groups or different outside groups that uh, like-minded um, industry people join. And there's, I'm sure everyone for every industry you can think of, um, but joining those groups then allows you to meet people from you know competitors or other companies within your industry um, and that's often the relationships that might make you stronger as an employee of your own company. Great. Thanks, guys. And thanks for the question in the chat. Other questions from the audience? I'll ask one. Um, and this can be to any or all of you. but. Switching a little bit, I think, to work-life fit, because this is something I still struggle with all the time. Um, what's something that you guys kind of struggle with from a work-life fit, work-life balance perspective, and how do you try to kind of actively combat that or address that? Um, I can start, I guess. Um, so one of the things I think everyone needs to do is you have to figure out what your priorities are um, is that, do you want work advancement? Do you want to be really well known professionally? Do you want to have a really thriving social life? Do you like to spend time with your family? Do you like to have hobbies? And all of those things are great, but you just have to prioritize which ones you want the most because it's not really feasible to have all of them. So you can't be top of your profession because you put all these hours into working, you go to all these conferences and you do all these extra work and you're like this amazing gardener and you have a thriving like you know multi-acre garden and you sleep 10 hours a night and you run marathons and you do all of these things that are very time intensive they're all great things but I think you just have to prioritize which ones you want the most and which ones make you the happiest and bring you the most joy and then put your effort into those um, because when you try to do too much then it all feels like work and then suddenly training for the marathon feels like a burden because you have to schedule in those long runs and you're trying to do this garden, but like you didn't water it for two weeks and so now it all looks like junk and you got to go tear it all out. So just figuring out what you want the most and making sure you put your, your time and effort into those things so that you get a reward out of it and you don't just burn yourself out with all of these hobbies that you've now turned into more jobs. And I think being honest with your coworkers or your supervisor of when you're taking that time, I think that's advice I got and works really well with, um, you know, people that report to me too is like, Tell me if you feel comfortable, tell me where you're going. Like, Hey, I'm off this Friday because I'm taking a trip, you know, to Pitts, back to Pittsburgh. And that way it gives them some way to connect with you when you get back on a Monday. Oh, Hey, how was your trip from Pittsburgh? Or, Hey, I've got to go to my, you know, child's, you know, recital or something like that. Um, don't try to feel bad for taking time to yourself. Um, you know, every, for the most part, every job has paid time off in some way, um, you know, take it. Don't let it just accrue. Um, and then when you do take it, be honest about when you're taking it, be honest with your team. Um, and then, you know, that makes you feel less guilty, which I didn't think a lot of us do when we're first out of school and trying to make a good name for yourself, you almost feel guilty for taking time off, but it's truly needed to balance out all the hard work you're doing. So be honest about it and take it. Yeah. Yeah. I just set those expectations kind of with the people we work with and, I definitely struggle with it as well, but trying this whole past year has obviously been a little bit unique and, you know, to the zoom fatigue issue that, that Aaron mentioned, just, just blocking off time on your calendar for, for you time to, to get through things. And if you want to go for a walk every afternoon or make sure you take a lunch break, that kind of thing, I think has been um, some, some success that I've, I've seen. And as you all go throughout your careers and develop and become leaders at wherever you're doing, I mean, it, also make sure you like build that culture and that environment that that allows other people around you working with you to be, be able to be themselves and and promote kind of the, the well-being side of things as well as I think is a, a key point. One more thing I'll throw in just because I think um, many of us were thrown into working from home over the past year and it seems like a lot of companies are intending of keeping some sort of that model. So I work exclusively from home and that is um, that was planned pre-pandemic and it will continue afterwards. So what I try and do is to make sure that I keep a good separation between when I'm working at my house and when I'm not working at my house. So I still like 
wake up and shower and get ready as if I was going to leave. Um, you know, I come into my office, I work, um, I still try to like follow working hours. And then when I leave, oftentimes I like change into something more comfortable. And then that way there's like this bigger separation. Cause it's really easy to kind of dabble in and out of it all day to be like, Oh, I'm sitting down and I'm in my office and okay. Yeah. It's almost eight o'clock at night, but like, I'm here. So maybe afterwards I'll do a few things like, and try and not get into that habit because otherwise you're going to spend your entire day sort of working where you feel like you've worked all day, but you haven't really gotten everything done. So setting those sort of boundaries early of when am I working? When am I not? How am I going to keep those separate? And even for those around you, if you have someone that you are, have a roommate or someone that you live with to say, okay, these are like, this is what it looks like when I'm working. So even though I'm home, like I'm not here to hang out. And that can be a challenge, especially if the person um, that you live with is still leaving to go to work. Yeah, thanks, Asha. That's a good one. I was thrown into working from home, didn't before the pandemic. And uh, in the beginning, I made the mistake of just like, you know, rolling to my desk, like from bed in my sweatpants, and that did not go well. And I quickly learned I got to got to change up that routine. So that's, that's good advice. Any other? Oh, Olivia, go on. Um, how, if you have any kind of experience with it, moving a relationship from coworker to like friend? Yes, I'll start. Um, I would say a lot of my adult friendships came from coworkers. Um, and it, it helps that a lot of the places I've worked have naturally had those friendships outside of work. So it wasn't like I was entering uncharted territory. Um, I just sort of was joining into their group. Um, one thing I think is important is to kind of lay your quote unquote ground rules with them. So are you going to talk about work stuff outside of work? I try really hard to avoid it because it feels like you're still at work. Um, and then the other challenging part, especially if you're in a situation where there's um, managers and those that report to managers and all of those different kind of hierarchies in a group is to, again, lay out those ground rules to say, hey, like, I just want to not talk about work when we're here because I'm here to hang out and be friends and, and not have to worry about, you know, if you say something that maybe is going to come up in a meeting or something later, you just never want to have those concerns. Um, but if you're trying to just forge a relationship from the very beginning, I think it's always easy to try and just chat someone up, you know, at a lunch break or something very, um, so within the work time and then kind of casually move it out. Like, Hey, I'm going to go grab a drink or I'm going to go get a food afterwards. Like, do you want to meet up or would you, would you like to join and make it very casual that way? And then it can move into things more pre-planned. Oh yeah, I'd agree. I mean, I think again, depends on what type of environment and career you're, you're moving into and, and who you're surrounded with. I mean, where I started, I started with, you know, another 10 or 15 people my age and everything. And we, we just generally had a lot of commonalities and interests and it was kind of very natural to, to be friends outside of work as well. But I definitely agree with, you know, coming up with, with what is important in your boundaries and priorities with regard to those relationships and um, making sure you're, you, you understand where, where you want to be with those uh, going into it, I think is a, a key item. Yeah, I think just to add on, I think um, just saying yes to stuff too, like saying yes to a happy hour, even if you don't necessarily know um, those people super well or work with them like on a day-to-day -day basis, or even like saying yes to go to lunch. In the beginning, definitely when I started um, at my job, I would like have a lunch in the fridge. But if people were going to lunch, I'd be like, yep, I'll go <laughs> just because it's like a good chance to socialize. And then, you know, the, 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 the lunch in the fridge maybe gets eaten, maybe doesn't. But uh, so I think saying yes to stuff like that just to meet more people. Any other uh, final questions from the, the audience as we get close to the end here? We have a question in chat. Uh, does dating become easier after college? It's a great question. I feel like I ha I feel like I have to let Alex start this one. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I think Gordon should start. He's the one that's that's been dating the same person for what twelve years or something. <laughs> yeah, I'm the worst answer that I did not have to date after college. <laughs> you were in college. I didn't either, so I can't help. <laughs> <laughs> All you, Alex. No, I mean, it, it, I mean, it depends. It depends on every relationship. I hate to, to kind of 
punt to that being the case. But um, for someone like myself moving around to, to now my third city in the past like four years, obviously that, that comes with its own unique challenges, but also opportunities when it comes to dating and meeting new people and, and trying new things out. So um, I'm not necessarily sure what easier means. I, I'd say uh, it, it really depends on your environment and the people you surround yourself with. And obviously there's plenty of apps. That's another way to get out there and meet people. Um, and, and maybe, you know, maybe they, they start off with a potential dating and they turn into more friendships. Um, definitely seen that, that happen. So who, who told you to, to ask that question? Chris? That's, <laughs> yeah. that's what I want to know. Someone definitely planning that in the audience for me. <laughs> That was a great question. Um, I'll kind of wrap up the panel with one final question. Maybe Gordon, I'll give this to you. Um, you know, for those for those uh, grads that are moving to other areas, how how would they get involved with the regional pit chapter or find out if there's a regional pit chapter where they're moving and how would they go about doing that? Sure. Yeah, I highly recommend getting involved with your regional pit chapter. The easiest way is literally just to go on the Pit Alumni Association's website. And there's an entire list of chapters and the, the main contact of that person and email address typically. Um, and yeah, we have chapters in pretty much every major city across the country. I lead the one here in Denver. And especially after graduation, we try to do a big reach out to everyone moving into the market like Sydney's going about to move out here to Denver. Um, and it's a great, very, very easy way to meet um, you know, kind of like-minded people um, that you all have a connection back to Pitt. So if you're interested, yeah, just go on the PA website and um, they have a list of all the different alumni chapters. Awesome. Well, thank you to all our panelists and thank you to everyone who asked some questions. Hopefully you found this uh, session helpful. Um, and I think before we close out, I think Aaron has a, has a poll for the audience. Yes. So first of all, thank you so much to the panelists. This was amazing. You could see the poll um, jumping up right there. If you could just answer a couple of those questions, it really helps us out um, quite a bit. Um, fabulous, fabulous job. Thank you so much um, for all of your guidance and your input on everything. It was absolutely wonderful. Please, please remember to um, continue this fun with Adulting 101 by attending our final adulting program that will be tomorrow, same time, seven o'clock, um, same structure. So it's gonna be a presentation by Gabby, um, who also works in the Career Center, and then a, a panel again, an alumni panel. So it's absolutely wonderful. Gabby just put it in the chat. Um, so you can click on that and register, um, see the link, everything like that. Um, but thank you so much again, everyone, and I hope you have a very, very lovely evening. Thanks, Aaron. See you, everyone. Thank you. A little bit. Good job, guys. Thanks. <laughs>